Don't get two bags. I, I know it's your I birthday, like but don't this get two bags, okay? I farted. Oh, I always in my bag. Ghost? No, just tell and judge me. That's the other one. Oh, that's the one I wanted to go to. This is first time with Chick fil A. How you like it, buddy? Oh, he's coming back next year for that. Down on purpose. Get it, Josh, get it. Is that your first time, too? <laughs> you were late because of her. You couldn't figure out an outfit this morning. She woke up at 5. It was 6.30 and she still couldn't figure out what to wear. Oh my gosh. Come on, man. If you're going to take that long for an outfit, you got to <laughs> at least. Is it a nice outfit? No. Oh, it's just not. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, how do you like the sandwich? How do you like the sandwich? <laughs> What did you call her? Baby. I'm trying to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's go. Lunch is over. Lunch is over. We are going to go to the worship class. The worship class. Because Mede wants to learn how to sing for the Lord. Oh, they close. Mede, she already sings a lot. Okay. <laughs> she sings too much. But yeah, we're about to go. Let's go, Carol. Follow me. I'll be your disciple. I mean, I'll be your leader. Come on, Carol. Let's go. Baby, what are we doing? Just marking everywhere the territories. Marking territories everywhere. Everyone. Everybody's going to think you're the famous. More freebies. More freebies. Came back from the worship. The whole gang's here. Whole gang. And we have an outcast. We are gonna start the second part of the conference, which is the hell part. So the morning was heaven, and now it's hell. And there's gonna be another speaker on that. And then there's gonna be another workshop. Uh, rude people interrupting us but yep Alexis say hi say hi um, but other than that get ready to worship
problem is, this isn't the way the Bible talks about it. Let me explain what I mean. If you were to go to Bible Gateway, and uh, we'll use the NIV here, we'll type in heaven and hell, we click search, it's going to show us how many times the two words appear together in the biblical story, like in the same verse. Maybe just take the world from the junk that's tearing it apart, and to push evil and the rebellion out to the periphery, where it can no longer hurt, harm, or destroy it. I think we see the same narrative logic in a lot of our fairy tales and the, the dreams and the stories that we like to tell about our world. So I, I remember this being, striking me when I was reading with my five-year-old daughter a few years back. We were reading The Voyage of the Dawn Trip, C.S. Lewis book. And in this book, there is a, the good king, but he's been away for a while. And while he's been gone, there's this kind of evil, corrupt regime that's taken over this island, one of those islands. And under this corrupt governor, there's oppression and injustice and slave and exploitation. And on the island, you have some people who are just like making a heyday out of it, like going, hey, life is good. They're, they, they've aligned themselves with the corrupt order. You have others, though, who are holding out hope, this longing that the good king's going to come back. And they're getting their lives ready and preparing. And eventually, the boy, the, the dawn treader, the boat lands. The, the good king gets off. And, uh, and he begins to see how bad things have gotten, and subversively this movement forms around him, and ultimately they take the castle. And when the word spreads, like, the king's back, he's in the castle, for the most part, those who have aligned themselves against him run for the hill. Like, they head out of the capital, out of the center, the outskirts, so they know the jig is up. But those who have aligned themselves in hope and expectation that the good king and his reign is coming, like, they come rushing into the city rejoicing and celebrating. But there are some who try and stay. So there's this encounter with um, uh, Gumpas, the governor, and he, he's trying to work out this deal in the castle with, with the king. And he says, hey, why don't we, basically, why don't we work out a deal where, like, you just let us kind of run our mafia racket over here. We'll cut you in on some of the profit. You can still be kind of a good public face, but, you know, let us kind of do our thing. And how's the king going to respond? And everything in you, everything in my five-year-old daughter, she said, no, like, don't compromise with the bad powers. Don't let that junk still go on. Unfortunately, he does not. The king responds to the governor. He says, um, oh, I'm sorry, the location's not underground, outside the city. I wrote the fairy tale here. Uh, the king says, the only remaining question is whether you and the rest of the rabble will leave without a flogging or with one. You may choose what you prefer. Better late than never, Robert. Robert came in late. And we are going to our next workshop, which is, Carol, what's the next workshop? Check, love. We're going to the End Times Confusion. End Times Confusion. And it's gonna be exciting. What are they gonna talk about? End times, of course. All right, see you there, guys. There. For at in this room, how many people know what I mean by the millennium? Okay, you guys don't tell for loud first session. You guys know a little bit more. Okay, how many of you just heard of it, but you don't you don't really know what we mean by it? Okay, a lot of people. Okay, so when we map out different understandings and views of the end times. Everything is going to be centered around this concept of the millennium. And here's the passage where we get the concept of the millennium from. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. A strange passage. Here's the imagery. At some point in the future, or as we're going to see, some people don't think it's in the future. At some point, God is going to bind Satan for a thousand years. And once a thousand years is up, he's going to let him go for a little while. That's the, that's the structure of the millennium. Now, out of that come three massive views in which kind of every camp Places themselves in. And the three major understandings of the millennium are premillennialism, all millennialism, and postmillennialism. 
What I'm going to do is just briefly walk us through each of these and then show you and have a discussion on how the historical context at which you reside in shapes your understanding of the Bible so much that depending upon when and where you were living, you'd probably fall into a specific camp. Now, do we have anyone, before we talk about these, who, like, you are, and I'm not, no, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but, who, like, you're, you, you know which one you are. Okay, what do you got? Three. Three. Raise your hand if you, if, if. You don't have to know. Most people don't know even what we're talking about at this point, but you know enough that you know you're premillennial. Raise your hand. Okay. Pre-mill- premillennialism is the dominant view in American culture, especially in the last hundred years. The vast majority of evangelical Christians in modern America are premillennial. We'll get to what that is. Anyone identify all millennial? Oh, Kevin Kurtz and they. What? what? <laughs> Post millennial. I bet you know one. One, one, po- congratulations, you're the last post-millennialist <laughs> in America. No, uh, now no, we're gonna, this is gonna be interesting because there was a time where pretty much every Christian was post-millennial. We'll get into that. Uh, because historically, there was a big part, portion of church history Well, that was like the default position. Every single Puritan, all the early American theologians, Jonathan Edwards, they're all post-millennial. Okay, but let's get into what these mean, and then we'll kind of go, go from there. Oh, one other question I wanted to ask you is even if you don't know what you are, what were you taught in church? Were you even, how many of you have, like, you weren't, at your church, you didn't talk about, like, hurting more and more people. Yeah, sure, there's some people out here and there, but man, everyone I know is Christian, and you're not hearing about massive wars that are taken, going on on other places of, of the world, so it's, it's very optimistic, extremely optimistic. You're the new land. Man, Christ is going to come any time now. So by default, it just looked like the church was advancing and unstoppable. When did post-millennialism begin to die? World War I. World War I, it got knocked out and it tried to get back up and then World War II gave it a KO. Now it doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It means that the historical factors so shape our theology that sometimes our minds aren't even thinking in, this, in the same way just because of what's going on. So with World War I, man, if, if you haven't looked in and studied World War I, please do. Like the world we live in is shaped by World War I. The, it's called the Great War. And this was the first war where modern technology was able to truly spread the news of the horror. I mean, think, think about this. You got to see pictures. You, 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 you heard recordings. You, you, you heard the stories of what was going on in World War I, and it was absolutely horrific. So it didn't look like, man, we're marching forward and we're going to usher in the kingdom of God because peace on earth is arriving. No, it was hell on earth. So around that time, post-millennialism started to die, and now there's one person in the room who holds it. Well, actually, Does, I looked at the chart. I think you're I'm different. More, I'm more there's post trip pre-millennial. So there's no, there's not even any true more. There's not even a true post millennialism. <laughs> <laughs> now, all millennialism, Christ is currently ruling in heaven and in earth. When do you think that might have been popular? Got to go, 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 go back further, further. I'm talking like old, old, old. So if you're in the 700s, you're in 1000 AD. Yeah. There was one true church. One true, holy, Catholic, Roman church. Now, in, in, a, in a little bit, there'd be a branch split off with the Eastern Orthodox and some other schisms. But for the most part, there's not like multiple denominations. There's not different streams of Christianity. There's just the church. And who... How, how, who anoints the king? The Pope. So this is a big controversy about like who's most in charge. Big debate. Because it's like, well, the king was, but who, who, who is the one blessing and anointing the king to be the king? It was the Pope. Who speaks for God? The church. And so amillennialism historically had a very triumphalistic feel to it. It was Christ is ruling in heaven and he rules on earth through the church. 
And if you doubt that, who else is anointing the king? You see, you see how that was just the default position. Now, premillennialism. When do you think that got really popular? I mean, it's it's if if you're a modern evangelical Christian, I think I think the last research that was done it was something like seventy-seven percent, but I think that's an underestimate. I would say like ninety percent of people are dispensational premillennialists in in American Christianity. When when do you think that started to get popular? Close. Go back a little further. He said the '60s. Think about think about what what premillennialism emphasizes. What did, what did I say? There was a special relationship with who? Israel. Oh. Ethnic Israel. Oh. So after World War II, the nation of Israel is reconstituted for the first time in 2,000 years. In Israel, the ethnic Israel didn't have their own nation since the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So, optimism, one, is out the window. You just got through World War II. Is the world, is the world turning into a better place? No, it's, it's bad. So it's pessimism. And all of a sudden, Israel, ethnic Israel, is being gathered back into the land. And you're going, ooh, man. Dang, this, this stuff's shrouded. Right and there's some other things, too, because the Bible, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about the generation that sees these signs, that generation will surely not pass away. So the idea was, now that we've seen the signs, the wars and the rumors of war, and ethnic Israel's back in Israel, then we've seen the signs. This generation is going to be alive at the return of Christ. Now, how old is it? How, how do you count a generation in the Bible? 40 years. You count as 40 years? What else? 70 years and 120 years. There's different ways. There's different ways. So for the 40, for the 40 year generation, what you would do is you go, oh my goodness. Israel is reconstituted when? 1948. Ooh, 88. That's really close to something big. The year 2000. Which is like the culmination of the right. millennium. And you could say, well, we don't know exactly what the generation means. Maybe that's when the rapture happens. And maybe our calculations are a little off. So what about this? And, and I remember as a little kid, like, I didn't understand this, but it was scary to me because I knew that there, there was be like, in my mind, a, a rapture of seven years of tribulation. But I was like, it's going to, the end of the world's going to be in the year 2000, but there's going to be seven years of tribulation. So that means 1993 is when it's going down. Now, remember the, the cultural factors going on in that time period. What else might you think might make you think it's about to go down? Y two K. There was yeah, the Clinton scandal, of course. We'll get to that in a moment. It's a part of the prophecy. So you have Y two K, the the year two thousand. You have ethnic Israel. You have a pessimism, and so you guys got to understand like that pessimism shaped evangelical Christianity. So, for instance. Most of us, not all of us, but grew up in, in churches that had kind of a, a vibe that was like, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And so you just got to be faithful and wait for Christ's return. And each one of these views, premillennial, all millennials, postmillennials, they all have a danger to act out that theology in a way that can, can be harmful. So if you believe the world is going to hell in a handbasket, you just need to be faithful and wait for the return of Christ. You're not going to be planting flowers in your community to help you know the community garden. So you're going to be more isolationist. If you're post-millennial, oh, it's sunshine and rainbows. Maybe with the church is moving forward. It changes your mentality. It doesn't make one right or wrong. It just changes the ethos, the ethics of, of your particular church. And some of you grew up, raise your hand if you grew up like with somebody telling you, man, you better not be caught in a movie theater when the rapture happens. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it was like the movie, that's where the, the pagans were going. And so you know, the rapture was coming in. So it shapes, it shapes the, the theology. Now, premillennialism, for the, probably the first time in, I mean, I would say maybe 10 years, people are, are leaving that view. Why, why do you think they might be leaving that view? 
because no matter how, how you count the generation thing, it's, it's, it's 2018. Israel is 1948, and it seems like all of that stuff had, had come and gone. But make no mistake about it. If we were alive during World War II, we would all be thinking this is the absolute end. You have Hitler. Who is he killing? Jews. Ethnic Jews. What is he doing to them? He's putting tattooing barcodes on their wrist. There is a global world leader tattooing ethnic Jews and killing them. That's the Antichrist. This is the end. But now that we're years removed from that, people are, you're seeing an uptick in amillennialism and a slight uptick in postmillennialism. But that's still, we're stu still too pessimistic. No one wants to think that. Doesn't mean it's wrong. I'm just saying cult culturally. Questions on that? Because we're about to enter the, what I really want to talk about. I just wanted to lay the landscape. All right, we just finished. Where are you going, Kara? You gotta be in it. We just finished the workshop and we are gonna be checking out the last one which is how to waking up zombie toddlers or something like that but you'll get a sneak peek it's from the 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 same speaker of the workshop so he's going to be doing the last little sermon or the little lesson that we're having and then some worship can't wait yeah i really love yeah almost at the unconscious level. It's like the operating system level. You know, when you interact with your, your phone, you are engaging the apps, but what's under the hood is the operating system. Everything is processed through that. So I'm talking like deep, unconscious operating system level. Because see, something's wrong. We are terribly sick. For two decades straight, Americans have become more discontent, more unhappy, more depressed, struggle with severe depression, more and have, we have more suicides than ever before. For two decades straight, suicide has gone up every single year in nearly every state. In other words, there's not a state you can go to in America where you find a little bit more happiness. We're becoming more sad, more depressed, more filled with anxiety, more suicidal. Now, what's crazy bizarre about this is as we become more unhappy, we simultaneously are becoming a people with a greater standard of living. What I mean by standard of living is the life you live is more comfortable than 99.9% .9 of all human beings who have ever walked God's good green earth. I mean, think about your standard of living for a moment. You walk into a grocery store and in a single instance see more food than some people saw in their entire lifetime. Or think about the crazy weather control system technology you have in the space you occupy. When you're in your car, it's too hot, what do you do? AC. AC. You control the weather. <laughs> if it's too cold, they get, what do you do? Someone turn on the heater. And what happens when like, it breaks. You know, you have an existential crisis meltdown. It's roasting in here. How could a good God exist in the midst of such evil? It's like immense suffering. What about this? When you have to relieve yourself, go poop. You go poop in this little puddle of water, and there's this handle that you push down, and it magically takes it away. You even got to deal with it. Yeah, you mentioned that. You know, most people have to dig a giant hole for the village. And that thing fills up with a massive poop. It smells like I have feet in every direction. When it fills up, you've got to go dig another hole. And you don't do that. It just kind of magically takes care of itself. Think about a transcendent one that we're all under, that infuses life with meaning. The radical claim of Christianity is this that the ultimate transcendent one, the sun above the sun, the ultimate meaning, the one who gives meaning and grounds to all things, he did not stay above the sun, but he loved us so much that he would come down while all religions, philosophies, and ideologies were reaching to the heavens to find transcendence, when all religions, philosophies, and ideologies were trying to find grounds for meaning and purpose. Meaning and purpose comes down to us and reveals a way, a truth, 
and the life from heaven. He sought us. And he wakes us up. He gives us a cure. He matures us. He wakes us up from our zombie-like state, and then he grows us to mature adults in the faith. And the radical claim of Christianity is that human beings have always tried to find those types of things, whether it was in Egypt or Ra or whatever philosophical system. But Christianity's claim is that God himself came to show us that. And if you're a Christian in this room, you've received that grace. so often we do it. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You know when you, you, you could be taking grace, you've taken granted of it too much and you don't realize it. Like when God showed you grace, like I was a tra- like I'm a, I was a train wreck. Life is whack. God found me and gave me grace. Made me alive. Brought me to life. And then with every single passing day is growing me and maturing me. And if you're a Christian in the room, You found this grace, or better yet, grace found you and brought you to life. In Ephesians, Paul articulates. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us for video number two of the Regeneration Project conference that we went to. Um, And if you didn't see number one, go ahead and click back to the number one because it'll put everything together. We had a great time. Uh, we saw MDR over there. We saw other people that we recognized over there. And a lot of youth went, and that's awesome, amazing that people are really curious about heaven and hell and then death and angels and demons and so on. But, uh, it, but going ahead, that today, the um, when this video released on Wednesday, the 31st, we're actually having a little game night at our church right here in between 7th and Maple. We're doing this to combat Halloween, going trick-or-treating, all that, all that pagan holiday. We're actually bringing in kids to share the good news and have fun with them, saying that we can have fun too. And if you want to join us, feel free to come by at 7 o'clock tonight, which is Wednesday the 31st, when the video releases. Uh, and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Stay tuned for another exciting videos that are coming up next Wednesday. Peace out, guys.